Uh, well, hello and uh, welcome to my presentation on Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company itself. Today, the goal is to show you that the Walt Disney Company is much more than a cartoon company. We will look uh, at Walt Disney himself and his enterprise in a general context. And also we will examine Walt Disney in a historical context because his first feature animation film and other productions are particularly important because they came out in 1933 in the era of Great Depression and following the Great Depression we saw the Second World War. And we will have a look at both of these aspects in a moment. So, in, in the late 1920s, Walt Disney's immense entertainment enterprise, short cartoons, featured animations, live action films, and his theme parks dominated the US, the Western world, and the bubble. By 1966, Disney creations and Disney consumer merchandise flooded much of the globe. From Chile to China, tens of millions of people who had never heard of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or William Faulkner, or Martin Luther King Jr., could identify Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck in an instant. So we will have a look at the story of this company and this individual. So, Walt Disney, as we see him, he was born in 1901 in uh, Illinois. He was one of five chocolate children. Uh, and we can see that throughout his life, he never had a chance to enjoy prosperity. They never had enough money. And then we can say that he studied art, design, and photography at McKinley High School. Roy and Walt started a new business with $750 in California, Hollywood. But, of course, this wasn't the first company Walt started. Uh, we will see the first company he started in a minute. And in 1925, Walt <laughs> married one of his employees, Lillian Down. They had two kids. He owned the patent for Technicolor for two years, which made him the only person who was able to produce color cartoons. So he had a huge advantage over uh, the cartoon business. He died in 1966 due to lung cancer. During his lifetime, he had 59, 59 Academy Award nominations and 22 Oscars. Uh, he also used the line between imagination and reality to create a wondrous universe where animals spoke, trees and plants acted consciously, and inanimate objects held emotion. So Disney seized upon the Depression era discourse of the common man's resilience and, and translated it into an idea of fantasy and humor. So Laffo Grant is the first company started by Disney. But in a short time it went bankruptcy. This studio was featuring the first animated characters created by Disney. In 1932, Flowers and Trees, the first color cartoon uh, which was used uh, in terms of the Technicolor, won the first Oscar. And Disney's first length, uh, full length and animated musical feature. In 1937, we saw Snow White and the Seven Wars. So, I would like to have a look at this aspect in, in uh, political terms. We all knew of these tales or his cartoons, his animations, but we never examined what really happened in terms of political attention. So, uh, we have a video to watch.
show you was <laughs> this specific moment because let's pay attention to the lyrics of the song. Hi ho, it's time to work we go. This is actually an attempt of the American idea. We can see that this song and its lyrics celebrates the virtue, the independence, and the dignity of the little guy who works so hard and maintains an upright character and actually wanted to overcome any kinds of adversaries offered by nature or the social order. So with this cartoon, obviously Disney aims to show some uh, respect to the working class and the average Americans. And we have three little pigs. Probably most of us know the tale, or maybe we have seen it. But again, we have never looked at it in the, in the terms of politics. And we have a clip again. <laughs> Look at that! There's those little puppets you can in the pool. Shall I tell you what it is? 
So, let's have a look at the major figures of Disney. I think we all know them, we're familiar with them. Uh, Goofy, Donald Clutter, Mickey Mouse, Winnie the Pooh. Lots of us has uh, seen these in our childhoods. And uh, these are his other major, highly acclaimed uh, productions. You know, he had Mary Poppins, which was the first live action show uh, by Disney. Alice in Wonderland, Sleeping Beauty, and Bambi. Uh, I would like to say a word about Bambi. So, uh, Disney had an effect on nature and conservatism. What he did was, he shot Bambi and he thought that maybe he could sensitize the public with the nature and trigger a debate on hunting. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Do you know uh, where did this come from? Did anyone see one before something like this? Uh, so this is the first appearance of Mickey Mouse in, this, in uh, Steamboat Willie. We, we, as the audience, first encountered with Mickey Mouse at this production. And it was a huge success. It was a breaking point for Walt Disney himself. And Disney famously said, I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. When he was a child, I learned that he wasn't the brightest person when, this is the words of his teachers, they were calling him the second dumbest person in the classroom because he was always daydreaming, he was never concentrating into his lectures, he never studied. But he had a passion for something else. He always drew cartoons, he always liked to entertain his friends. But the teacher saw this as a waste of time. But Disney said that it was all started by a mouse, so he always had the courage and belief in him, and he had the courage to pursue his dreams. So this is the famous uh, Mickey Mouse, and I would like to show you Mickey's Ten Commandments. Know your audience, identify your audience, wear your shoes guests, wear your guests shoes, uh, organize the flow of people and ideas. Create a visual magnet. In this case, it is Mickey Mouse itself. Communicate with visual literacy. Avoid overload. Tell one story at a time so people wouldn't get confused and they would just uh, get on with the flow. Avoid contradictions. Maintain identity. For, for every ounce of treatment, provide a ton of treat and keep it up. This was the primary philosophy of Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company itself. So, the Walt Disney Company. Walt Disney Company actually sold itself as a whole with its character-based merchandise, with its theme parks, with its music, with its cartoons, with its live-action films, with pretty much everything. So, what we can say about this company is that it was founded in 1923 by Walt and Roy Disney as the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio. The first name was this. It wasn't Disney Studios. After a while, uh, Disney, Walt Disney said that, okay, let's change the company's name. And the brother didn't mind. This company is headquartered in Burbank, California. And according to Forbes, the Walt Disney Company is amongst the, the world's most valuable brands, it holds the 11th place in the world, with $179.5 billion, as we saw in May 2015. It has five business segments, uh, media networks, parks and resorts, studio entertainment, consumer products and interactive media. When I say interactive media, I also say there is a video game production company as well in the interactive media segment. So in 1966, please, the date is really important, just only in 1966, 240 million people saw a Disney movie. 
A weekly audience of 100 million watched the Disney TV show, 80 million read a Disney book. Of course, the, these are uh, pretty much assumptions based on statistics. Uh, so, Disney as an entrepreneur. What did he do as an entrepreneur? Disney realized that, uh, we could say that he is the first motion picture mogul to realize that TV is an ally rather than an adversary. adversary. So, here are some companies that Walt Disney owns. Disney, ABC Television Group, ESPN, Disney Parks and Resorts, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and Pixar Studios. So, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, Disney Company is much more than a cartoon company. We always knew it as a cartoon company, but we will see in further detail right now. Disney ABC Television Group, uh, its work includes broadcast television, cable television, and radio business, but I particularly focused on two segments. In context of the US, the broadcast TV work has more than 200 local TV affiliates across the country. In terms of cable TV, more than 100 Disney branded cable networks reaching uh, 164 countries and territories around the world. So actually, this is a result of global capitalism. If you have the power, if you have the agency to go and purchase the rights to broadcast in several different countries, you also make a promotion of yourself, you also sell yourself and people can consume you. For instance, Pinocchio. When you watch Pinocchio, you consume Pinocchio. When you consume Pinocchio, you consume Disney itself. Marvel. Everybody knows Marvel. But I just wanted to mention it briefly. Marvel Comics revolutionized the superhero genre in the 1960s with comic book characters such as Spider-Man, Thor, Iron Man, and The Hulk. Lucasfilm and Pixar. Lucasfilm is best known for producing the Star Wars series. Uh, it is one of the biggest grossing franchises uh, in history. And uh, this company was founded by George Lucas himself. He was the first director of Star Wars New Hope. And he just continued the legacy. He also had a company called Industrial Light and Magic, which was renamed after a while to Pixar Studios. Uh, this is one of the most known images of Pixar Studios' Toy Story. I believe at least uh, one of its movies we saw it generally. And uh, I would like to uh, share an interesting fact. Till the day of his death, Steve Jobs was the chief executive behind Pixar Studios until his death. ESPN. What was ESPN? What did they do? What power do they have globally? In 2005, ESPN was available to approximately 94 million paid television households in the US. So this is the US context. But let's have a look at the broader context. ESPN broadcasts in more than 200 countries operating regional channels in Australia, Brazil, Latin America, and the United Kingdom. So what does this tell us? Again, we could relate this issue to global capitalism. How do we relate it? They have the power to go and broadcast any program they want. And they are not just broadcasting only one thing. Not just football, not just basketball. They have lots of segments of their broadcast business. And Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. I believe that this is the most obvious thing to show us the results of global capitalism. Disney never stood stable. He always thought advance, 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 never stop. So we saw that in the first in California, Anaheim, the first Disneyland opened, and then it spread all over the world. In, in the US, we have uh, one in California and in Florida. So Disney sell itself as a whole with its character-based merchandise available almost at 
every Disney mall and Disney store. So, what did people have before Disneyland? Weren't there any amusement parks before Disneyland? What was the particular thing that made Disneyland unique? That was the question I asked. So I found that, of course, there were amusement parks before Disneyland, but they were just a grab bag collection of various rides, shows, and games. But what Disney did was he reconceptualized the amusement park concept and made it a full imaginative experience as a theme park. Uh, so also, under one company, uh, what did Disney do? He was the first person to come and bundle TV shows, live action films, Dis Disney uh, character based merchandise, cartoons, short animations, full length features, animations. He just got them and get, he just get it done under one company. And this was why he was the first person to reconceptualize this uh, concept of the amusement parks. Now, I have a video to show. Also, there is a well-known 
fact that Disney is the world's largest licensor with global retail sales of $23 billion for 2006. Disney Consumer Products Global Stationery. We could say that Disney never stopped by just focusing on the US. They expanded their businesses. Where did they expand? To Latin America, Brazil, the Middle East. They expanded all over the place. And also, uh, I specifically put that image over there, Disney princesses. We can say that with only Disney princess merchandise, with their clothes or doll babies, they made a huge investment in them, and what happened was there was a huge revenue coming out. Uh, I believe that today we have four billion dollars of uh, value marked on Disney princess uh, uh, merchandises, and I would like to uh, show you Disney himself at the opening of Disneyland. Disneyland is your land. Here he relives fond memories of the past. And here you may savor the challenge and promise of the future. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America. With the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. All the time. So uh, this was an excerpt from uh, the opening of Disneyland, the first Disneyland. So uh, I want some quotes and I, I just wanted to share with you. Disney said that all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Disney never lost courage or belief in himself and he always was in favor of pursuing them. He pursued it, he made something out of nothing. And this quote is also one of my favorites. Laughter is timeless, imagination has no age, and dreams are forever. And right now, Walt Disney's dreams literally will live a long life. I believe like that because we can see that around the globe, uh, whichever country you go, you can immediately see that a child's enthusiasm towards a Disney product. In fact, I could give an example from Turkey. You know, uh, there's these stationary shops uh, everywhere in the world, and uh, I encountered a few times, there was a little child coming uh, into the store with his mother, mother, and when he or she, it doesn't matter, when she, he or she just saw the Disney branded a bag, or pencil case, or just a pencil, or a notebook, the person immediately wants to purchase that item, not anything else, because they love Disney. Why do they love? Because they grew up watching Disney cartoons, and they grew up consuming Disney itself. So these are my uh, sources, uh, my bibliography, and uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I can take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, it was really nice to go back on memory lane. And, uh, I was just going to ask your opinion about one of the cartoons uh, concerning uh, perhaps Walt Disney's political pragmatism. It, it, one of the starting cartoons, uh, in the end of the cartoon, uh, he uh, lists the number of freedoms that the U.S. offers. Freedom of speech, freedom... Uh, Which of these? It was probably in one of the beginning cartoons you put the video. Ah, uh, yeah, was in the video. Oh, okay. and in that video, it was a World War II video, uh, something uh, caught my attention. He talks about the freedom from wants. Uh, I think this is very significant because this is the World War II period and I think around this time uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was 
talking about a new Bill of Rights, and this was an essential part uh, to add. You know, in the standard American context, we have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom to uh, pursue happiness. But this idea of freedom from want was actually introduced uh, in the New Deal, and especially these additional Bill of Rights. It was never realized in the US, and uh, then you showed us how he actually contributed to Ronald Reagan's campaign, and uh, would you agree that this shows Walt Disney's uh, pragmatism? In World War II context, he refers to the freedom of want, but later on, going into the Reagan era, or the beginning of California uh, governorship, he contributes to that campaign. Does that symbolize the pragmatism, or is it, how do you view that? Uh, indeed, that's a very uh, vital point uh, that you've got, and I will certainly agree that he's a really pragmatist person. Because uh, in the era of Great Depression, uh, during the World War II, it's not an easy thing to keep uh, to keep it running, to keep it rolling. It's not an easy job, especially for those historical contexts. So what he did was basically to. Uh, try to survive the era. And uh, when I said he was known for his uh, close tie with the government, this is also a pra pragmatic approach to the uh, occasion. He always wanted uh, to have good relationships with the government in case that he had any kinds of adversity. He, he would know that the government would help him. And yes, here we are. Today we have lots and lots of uh, theme parks of him, and uh, even in any part of the country, in Turkey or anywhere else, you would see his character-based merchandise. People, especially children, children are going crazy when they see those Mickey Mouses or Donald Duck figures. They just want to take them, grab, hug them. This is the emotional part for the children. But uh, we could say that going and purchasing a Disney uh, character-based merchandise is also consuming Disney itself. So he, he uh, died in 1966, and his dream still lives. Still, we know Walt Disney as the pioneer of uh, the animation industry. And uh, again, I could definitely say that he was a pragmatist, uh, so he could survive till this day, and he made something out of nothing, and here we are. Okay then, uh, I guess there are no further questions. So, uh, thank you so much again for listening to me and for being here.